Welcome to the Supply Chain Ambassador Podcast. I'm your host, Bruno, helping you navigate the world of supply chain in a fun and engaging way. On today's podcast, I have a fellow Algonquin graduate, someone I had looked up to during the years learning supply chain in Algonquin supply chain program. Frankly, I think he has done very well for himself. Helping me learn about careers in supply chain, please welcome Jordan Daly Frey. Jordan is the manager with EY Canada's supply chain and operations consulting practice. He is passionate about problem solving and believes organizations can use technology to accelerate business transformations, find efficiencies, and arrive at better outcomes. Jordan has 15 years experience working in various supply chain and management roles and has spent the last five years helping public sector organizations digitally transform their procurements he recently worked with the Government of Canada to design and deploy Canada Buys Solution, an electronic procurement solution incorporating the SAP Ariba and SAP Field Glass platforms. Welcome, Jordan. Hey, Bruno. Really glad to be here. Can you tell us a bit more about your journey in supply chain and how you got to your current role? For sure. About seven or eight years ago, I was at a, a bit of a turning point in my career. I had spent the last couple of years in sales and years before that working for an inventory management organization. And I knew that sales wasn't where I wanted to end up and that I had a real passion for operations management and kind of improving uh, processes and getting better outcomes in the organizations that I worked for. And so I actually went back to school to that Algonquin College program for supply chain management. There, there was something really compelling about that degree. I thought it was really great to have a, a college program offering a full degree program and kind of the opportunity to participate in co-op classes and, and get more of a hands-on learning experience. And then after college, when I finished, I joined Deloitte as a, one of the consulting firms that has a pretty large SAP practice here in Ottawa. Spent some time there, and about three and a half years ago, I joined Ernst & Young EY, specifically, honestly, because they had this really interesting new program that they were working on with the Government of Canada to develop Canada Buys, which is any procurement platform that, that you talked about. And so the last three and a half years, I've maintained my focus uh, on that program and have spent a lot of my time there. But at the same time, because it's been live for a couple of years now, I've also had the opportunity to go off and, and do some other things with smaller organizations to deploy e-procurement technologies, as, as well as start to look at some of the you know, the underlying procurement tools and vehicles that are used and think of maybe some different ways to, to operate to, to get better outcomes. Wow. Clearly, you have worked for both the public and the private sector. So what are some notable experiences you had in each one? And you, I think you brought up Canada Buys. Yeah, so Canada Buys is certainly the most invested. I've been in a public sector organization's success. The, the opportunity to be part of a program where we're trying to rethink how government procures is, you know, incredible. So if we think about what the objectives were of that program of trying to, to really reshape the business and digitize things that were previously on paper, shift it so that procurement officers can get their bids in immediately instead of having to wait for paper to show up at plus at the pultage, things like that. Um, the thing with public sector is you have an opportunity to make a huge impact, right? So through the last couple of years in particular with the COVID procurements and the, all of the work that the government has done to procure PPE and to procure vaccine things, we can really see the impact of what we're doing. So if we've had a chance to help somebody get, get their COVID procurement into Canada buys, where they're able to get responses from suppliers immediately instead of having to wait a week. That ability to make an impact in public sector, I think, is really high. Uh, from the private sector side of things, there's certainly some organizations that are on the cutting edge, and those have been really fun to work with as well. Every organization, there's mature, and then there's less mature organizations. The ones that are really 
pushing the envelope around what we can do around technology, around what we can do about processes, and even something as simple as establishing centers of excellence and, and how they treat different topics. The chance to work with some of those private sector organizations has been really uh, helpful. And what I really like about that, and I think we'll talk a little bit about consulting more broadly in a moment, but what I think is really helpful for me personally is I can go work with some of those private sector organizations for a short period of time get some really interesting insights of the best of the best of a certain space do and that i can bring that back to my other engagements and my other clients and talk about what you could do it this way you don't have to but you could and it's an interesting thing to explore so wow so let's get into more about what you do can you describe your current work and what exactly that you do i i fit it into two different buckets so the one bucket is i'm, I'm definitely focused on digital transformations and um, specific around e-procurement, right? So a lot of the procurement processes that organizations have right now are still very paper-based. This is certainly a sector or a function that is maybe lagging a little bit compared to some of the other functions or compared to finance, for example. Uh, a lot of folks in the procurement space are still conducting their contract negotiations over email or mm. calling up a supplier and, and building that relationship at you know a very working level, which is great. And not to take anything away from the folks who do that work, because I think it's really meaningful work and those connections when turn on a dime are super valuable. Mm -hmm. But there's a big opportunity to introduce a little bit more technology into the space to help folks move quicker, to help provide a little bit more organizational control, to get actual data about what's going on so we can find where do we actually need to improve instead of just qualitatively assessing where we think improvements would be helpful. So that's the first part, is really going in, helping organizations digitize those functions. The second part, and this is the part that's maybe a little bit more flexible, is just helping organizations get better outcomes. And so the procurement one is an interesting one. Government has a lot of constraints when it comes to procurement. We've got trade agreements, we've got you know TBS policy, we've got PSBC kind of standards and policies, the supply manual, and many departments have their own kind of individual smaller policies that, that also apply. So how do we meet all of those obligations while still you know, trying to go fast, while still trying to turn things around for our clients who need things in a month, that the product needs to be here, but we still need to meet our obligations. Spending time digging into what are the specific issues that a department has or an agency or a sector within a department and trying to tease out like, okay, what can we really do differently to meet these obligations? And there's things like, Maybe it's the procurement vehicle, right? Maybe there's something that we can do there. Maybe there's an automation opportunity. Maybe the week that it takes for the business to get their request through to the procurement officer who's actually going to help them. And if we solve that, we solve a big part of the, the challenge. So really digging into the business side of it and helping our clients optimize, we'll say. Not just the work, not just optimize the process and save time and cost and whatnot, but optimize the outcomes and like, how do we get better results? What are some misconceptions that you have heard about what you do? So one of the misconceptions that I've heard, and we typically hear this with folks who we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Some folks worry that consultants are there to cut them out or to get rid of their jobs or along those lines. And the reality is that's not why we're there. That's not why we want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, I just really like improving things. That is that is what I want to do. I think that's what most uh, folks who I work with want to do. We want to get better outcomes. Yeah. And external perspectives can help, right? So there's the skills that we can bring specific to certain areas, which are, of course, valuable. But also sometimes it's just a matter of getting that external perspective, getting somebody who's not there in the weeds day to day to say, hey, there could be a different way of doing this. And so I think that can be really helpful. And getting past that, I think, is something that I really pride myself on. Uh, and I think for the most part, that's what a good consultant would pride themselves on, is creating a personal connection, helping our clients understand we're really there just to help. We want to do good work with you. We want to see you succeed. And ideally, like a perfect scenario is we're setting something up so that our clients can operate it and they don't need to call on us. That's the perfect world. Why is the work you do so important? 
So I think part of it comes back to that idea of an external perspective. So there's two things, right? So there's the external perspective where we can come in, we can bring a view that is maybe new or different. That external perspective can be grounded in things we're seeing elsewhere. So it can be things that we're seeing with other clients. So as an example, when we're bringing certain topics to some of our government clients, we have the ability to reach out to other EY entities essentially around the world and say, what did you do in England when we were dealing with this? What did you do in Germany when you were dealing with this? And so it's a way of uh, information sharing. And now our government clients are also doing that, right? Like governments talk to one another, um, but it's just about, there's so much out there mm -hmm. and it's, we can bring some different perspectives grounded in things that have been done in the past. So that's the one piece. Yeah. Uh, the second piece, I think, is there are some specific skill sets that we can helpful for. The one example that I, that I would typically bring up for this is if you're going to embark on a big transformation project, right? Mm -hmm. The reality of how most organizations are structured is that the folks internally have probably worked on one mm -hmm. or zero, right? Just because how many transformation, massive transformations are you going to do in your career? It's not that many if you're in one organization. Hopefully it's not that many if you're in one organization. Whereas you can bring people in who've been on three, four, five transformations, who've seen some of the ways things go wrong and can, you know, help guide you through those particularly tough waters. Yeah. What is one thing you enjoy about your work? So one thing that I like about my work is the different people that I get to meet. So I'm I'm maybe not the, the most people person <laughs> by nature, but I really do like learning about what different folks do, particularly in Ottawa. Like this is such a small town. It's so common that I meet other people who I have a connection to through some other means. I'll, I'll have a client and they'll message me a week later and say, hey, do you know, like he works for this other place that you were at? And like, yeah, yes. And so just learning more about people, getting to know them, create a connection outside of work a little bit. It's the people we meet make our careers and, and make our lives. And I think one of the great things about consulting is the ability to go out and, and see people from different spaces, get different perspectives. When I was at some of my previous places before, before I went back to school and all of that, you end up in a space where the people you meet are the people who work there and it's a small world and I like being in this big pond there's so much to do yeah absolutely let's talk about some of the challenges that you've faced and how did you overcome those challenges so I think one of the challenges that that we can deal with is change resistance right and this is on probably every project I've ever worked on, both when I was in consulting and also when I wasn't in consulting, right? Like people, even people who want change are resistant to change. And I think about it in my own life, like even if I'm, and I view myself as a very change positive person, I love change, but if someone else is trying to get me to change, my hackles go up and I'm not so into it anymore. That's my first reaction. So it's totally natural, totally normal. So we, we go into organizations and sometimes people don't want to change. Like they, they like the way they've been doing it. Even if the outcomes aren't as good as they could be, even if it means they're spending time doing things they don't actually like doing, just the act of change is hard. So that's probably the biggest challenge. From an overcoming perspective, I think there's a couple of things we do, right? So one of them is about really being clear on what's the benefit of change, right? So if we focus on what are those outcomes? We think about Canada Buys is a great example, right? Where we're taking folks who, um, who are used to GC docs and they're used to email and they're used to printing things and having a file cabinet. And you're yeah. saying like, hey, we don't need that. We're gonna put this all in the cloud. And it's that's a massive change to how you do your day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and I get yeah, that's difficult. And so being clear on what the benefits are, Right? Because of this, you're going to be able to get these other things. You're going to be able to get better data. You're going to be able to get a wider net. You're going to be able to report on your socioeconomic commitments. Like all of these things are the so what to the change. So that's the one thing. And then the other thing is we need to make it manageable. You can have all the benefits in the world, but if the change is too hard, like it's, it's 
it's not going to work. People just won't adopt. Um, and so really breaking it down and making the change bite size as much as possible, making it something that people can stomach. Definitely makes a lot of sense to me. Can you tell us some of the cool initiatives that you're currently working on? There's some pretty interesting stuff happening in the procurement space. And I think procurement and supply chain more broadly, like the pandemic has really highlighted the need for technology and, and transformation here. Even that shift of, well, we were in the office and now we're at home, like we saw a huge, a huge um, shift in approach in those first, you know, six months after the pandemic. Yeah. People are shifting how they view file management, right? How they view negotiations, like everything from a procurement standpoint is is shifting. So you've got things like SAP Ariba or SAP Field Glass, which are you know part of that Canada Buys platform. And you've got other e-procurement tools that are more akin to a procurement slice of the big ERPs that we all use. But there are some really cool point solutions that deal with specifically, okay, let's talk about clause management, right? Let's talk about how we how we stop using contract templates and just taking our last version and bringing it forward and like the legal risk that that creates. So let's talk about bringing in some clause templates. So we've done some interesting work around contract intelligence things. So basically looking through organizations, entire contract repository, scanning them using like uh, OCR to, you know, digitally scan the paper copies, pulling out keywords, key terms, pulling out clauses, building a clause library out of the existing content and then going through like a harmonization exercise to to create like a, a usable clause library, which legal can vet, and then you can build like a an intelligent authoring uh, solution. And so there's really cool stuff in that kind of space and kind of those areas on the core to, to the procurement officer's job, but mm -hmm. on the fringes in the technology sense where like right now the technology focus is still workflow, project management, document management, solicitation management but there's all this other stuff that we can start to do to really leverage like ai and ocr and and some of those other tools machine learning things like that to to really make the procurement officer's job simpler mm -hmm. and provide more control from an organizational standpoint very exciting indeed i know i would definitely like to see some of those technologies help me out in my day-to-day -day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's one of the toughest parts for government employees i think who are, who are doing procurement is dealing with those contracts and those templates you know going through that back and forth with legal sometimes can be tricky yeah absolutely how can listeners find out more information absolutely they can reach out um, i'm always super excited to as, as i said earlier to talk to people, learn more about them, learn about the, the challenges that their organizations are having. I've got my LinkedIn where I'm, I'm super accessible, Jordan Billy Fry. I'm also available through email, of course. I assume you can put my email in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, reach out, uh, have a conversation. I'm not, uh, I'm not like a sales guy per se. I just want to talk, just want to have uh, a conversation about where we can help. Are there things that are already happening that can help you? There's so much going on in government that can be really tough to figure out what else is even out there, right? So that we may be able to help connect you to another government organization that's already solved this problem or already started working on solving that problem. So yeah, so reach out. Really happy to talk to anyone about the procurement challenges that they're, they're facing. And that email, could you repeat it for our listeners? Just yeah, it's uh, Jordan Daily Fry, so J O R D A N dot D A L Y hyphen F R E Y at C A dot E Y dot com. Perfect. Any call to action for listeners? Call to action would really just be take advantage of the opportunity that we have right now. So the pandemic has really shifted the landscape of procurement and the general kind of workforce changes that are going on have also shifted the landscape of procurement. Um, and there's never really been a better time to fix some of these underlying challenges, right? Like it can be tough, you're in the thick of it. The best time to, uh, I'll use dieting because that's where I'm currently at in my life, but the, the best time to go on a diet is yesterday, but the second best time to go on a diet is today. And similarly, when we've got things in our organization that we think could be better, like the best time was yesterday, but the best time could be today. Reach out, have some conversations, talk to other people within your own community, leverage kind of the tools that, that Bruno is giving here and, and the connections that Bruno is providing you all. And just really like focus on those outcomes and, and 
how we can do things better with this technology to help solve some of our challenges. Fantastic. That was great. There was a lot to digest here, and I'm sure I'll be going back a couple of times to this episode just to make sure I, I really soak in all that very important information. So thank you very much for sharing that, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Bruno. Um, like I said, in the pre part of this conversation before the recording started, I've been a really big fan of this podcast and I really appreciate you having me on. It's, uh, it's really interesting to hear all these different folks from across the supply chain community in Ottawa. It's great that you've created this kind of network of people and just really interesting to learn what everyone has to say. There's so much good stuff here. Thank you. That's extremely valuable feedback and I really appreciate that. I will leave off with the uh, quote of the day today from uh, Tina McDonald, a leadership facilitator and career coach who once said, don't judge your ability by what you can do now. Your ability is what you can do next. And that's pretty exciting. Look at where you're going, not where you are. And I think this ties into a lot of the change components that you had just mentioned earlier and how that what we're doing currently, we can definitely improve, but let's not be afraid of that change, afraid to take that step. So yeah, I love it. Great quote. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for now.